All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I'd like to welcome you to the January Ag Sector Council seminar titled Increasing Resilience Through Improved On-Farm Storage. The Ag Sector Council series is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by Seed the Future's Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development, or KDAD, project. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USA Bureau for Food Security. And I'll be your host and facilitator today, and we'll be managing the Q&A portion of the event. For those of you who regularly attend these seminars and webinars, thank you so much for returning. We appreciate your repeat business um, and, and your repeat suggestions for helping us improve these events. If this is anyone's first AgriLinks event, we'd just like you to know that we hold monthly seminars on a variety of topics that are of interest to the ag development community and we place a heavy emphasis on participant engagement. Uh, so in that vein, we definitely encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box, to post your questions and comments at any time, and to share links to resources that you might think would be of interest to the others who are joining here today. Uh, so again, we encourage you to ask your questions throughout the presentation today, but we will hold most of those questions until after the, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentations so that we can ask them during a dedicated Q&A session uh, at the last half an hour or so of the webinar today. Just to quickly orient you to the screen you have, on the very left side of your screen, you'll see a file downloads box that contains a couple of background documents on the Ag Results project, which we'll be discussing today, and uh, a couple of links uh, to the event page where we'll post uh, re additional resources uh, from this webinar. This webinar is also being recorded, and we'll send you an email um, after the fact in about a week or so's time with the uh, webinar recording, transcript, and a few additional resources so you can review what you saw today or pass them on to your colleagues. Uh, lastly, before we get started, I just wanted to mention two upcoming events. Next Tuesday, we are having an AgriLinks Ask Ag comment chat uh, on the topic of measuring resilience, which we think will be very interesting, focusing on resilience, m and &E, and especially how it uh, pertains to agricultural development. Uh, so you'll probably get an email if you're on our email list uh, letting you know about that comment chat and encouraging you to submit your questions. And also, next month's Ag Sector Council seminar uh, will cover agricultural education and training with the Feed the Future Innovate project, and will be held on Wednesday, February 17th. And although today we're doing webinar only, next month we'll be back to our in-person uh, component if you'd like to join in-person in Washington, D.C. Um, and we always have a, a great coffee networking half hour before the actual start of the webinar, so it's a good reason to join in-person if, uh, if D.C. is your home base. All right, it is time to dive into the content of today's webinar. We're very excited to have a great panel of speakers, Aviva, Betsy, and Power who are joined in our webinar control room right here in Washington, D.C., and are excited to discuss uh, the AgResults project and the topic of post-harvest on-farm storage uh, for smallholder farmers. So with that, I would like to introduce Aviva Kutnik, who is a USAID Foreign Service Agriculture Officer working in the USAID Bureau for Food Security's Office of Market and Partnership Innovation. She is the USAID donor representative on the Ag Results Steering Committee. And so, Aviva, welcome. Thanks, Julie. I'm glad to be here today and looking forward to today's discussion. So, Aviva, why is post-harvest storage so important to the Feed the Future initiative? Sure, that's a great question. What's the connection between post-harvest storage and Feed the Future? Generally, post-harvest storage increases the quantity and quality of food that farming households produce for sale and that they consume at home. Even without increasing yields or production volumes, if we were just able to reduce post-harvest losses, there would still be a substantial gain to be had. The problem of post-harvest grain losses in sub-Saharan Africa is large. At a macro level, Losses are estimated at 1.6 billion U.S. dollars per year, which is around 14 or so percent of the $11 billion global grain market. And in Kenya, which is the country we'll delve into during the discussion today, post-harvest losses are estimated in the range of 9 to 15 percent, and perhaps even more for smallholder farmers. 
More nutritious food and increased incomes for smallholder farmers are key objectives of Feed the Future, which, as you know, Julie, is the U.S. government's global hunger and food security initiative focused in selected countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Post-harvest storage activities are under the Feed the Future objective of accelerating inclusive agriculture sector growth. USAID support to improve post-harvest storage are through three different areas. The first is improving agriculture productivity. The second is expanding markets and trade. And the third is increasing economic resilience of the households and in vulnerable communities. We support many activities promoting post-harvest market infrastructure, such as cold storage, grain silos, warehousing, processing facilities, feeder roads, and more. And today, our discussion will focus on storage on the on-farm level. OK, so storage is a tool to achieve agriculture and nutrition objectives under the Feed the Future initiative. In that vein, we wanted to pull up two uh, the fun, kind of fun poll questions just to get our audience thinking about two issues that we will be discussing during the webinar today. So for those of you joining, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know what you think, uh, where you think the greater value lies for smallholder farmers in using on-farm storage, and also where you think development dollars could be more efficiently spent. There's no right answer, just looking for your thoughts on these two questions. Um, so back to you, Aviva. How does many ways um, on-farm storage can help households are that they allow households to save grain for sale during off-season to realize higher market prices. The second way is that on-farm storage benefits households as Should I just do that? Okay. All right, we have tried switching Aviva's headset. So just to review quickly, um, on-farm storage can help households in multiple ways. Firstly, it allows households to store grain uh, for sale for sale during off-season to realize higher prices. Uh, secondly, on-farm storage benefits households as food or grain stored on-farm is generally close to the household and can be available for consumption when needed, not just at harvest time. And thirdly, quality storage can improve food quality and safety. For example, storage can protect against insect damage without the need to apply additional fertilizer pesticides. And improved storage may also control temperature and humidity to guard against aflatoxins and other contaminants that make food less safe. So on-farm storage can help farming households through an income effect, more money from off-season sales, and a nutrition effect, more and safer foods available at the household and in the community. Additionally, on-farm storage promotes resilience. I know, a bit of a buzzword these days, but still an all too important concept. This is one way that Feed the Future supports communities and households to better withstand unpredictable weather, flooding, catastrophes, volatile grain prices, and other shocks. On-farm storage targets the value-added benefits of post-harvest storage directly to the smallholder rather than other parts of the value chain. Thank you, Aviva, and, and thank you for uh, your patience, all of you joining the webinar today. Um, so we hope you're able to hear that great overview. And so uh, just one more question for you. Uh, USAID supports several activities under Feed the Future that work in this area. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about them? Sure, Julie. Indeed, we do. Both here at USAID headquarters in Washington, DC, as well as in our field missions abroad. Here in DC, in USAID's Bureau for Food Security, on the research and development side, we support two innovation labs. One for a reduction of post-harvest loss with Kansas State University, and another with Purdue University focusing on food processing. In the missions, there are numerous projects. For example, a post-harvest handling and storage project in Rwanda, and the CAVES project in Kenya, which works with farmers to increase demand for on-storage. 
No doubt there are also many other examples of which we'd like to hear more about from webinar participants today in the chat box during the discussion. What about your Office of Market and Partnership Innovations at AID? Through the office I work in at USAID, we support private sector and businesses to expand the commercial availability of on-farm storage in the marketplace. USAID supports a project called AFLASTOP, post-harvest drying and storage for aflatoxin prevention, that identifies the best storage options for smallholders and then markets them commercially through African businesses. And of course, ag results, which we are here to learn more about today. So lastly, what makes ag results AgResults is a multi-donor fund that offers prizes to the private sector to promote food security, health, and nutrition. Two unique elements, I'd say, are its prize rigorous monitoring and impact evaluation alongside the private sector prizes. I think I'll leave it there and introduce our speakers today to learn more about this topic. Our first speaker is Parastu Hamed, who is the field manager on AgResults. She manages the Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia projects. After that, we'll hear from Betsy Ness Eidelstein. Betsy specializes in evaluation of agriculture, nutrition, and microfinance programs. In her research on post-harvest loss, she authored the Kenya Country Chapter of a report on high potential intervention points for reducing post-harvest loss in African food systems. And then we'll hear, uh, joined remotely, um, by Tulika Narayan. Tulika Narayan is an agriculture and development economist and co-director of the Policy Analysis Method Center at APT Associates, with over 15 years experience conducting economic analyses to support agriculture and low emissions development. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paris to uh, Thank you, Aviva. As Aviva mentioned, I will be discussing the AgResults Kenya on-farm storage pilot. The AgResults project, as, as was mentioned, is an $18 million multi-donor initiative that implements pilots that incentivize high-impact innovation. The pilot project, the program is set up in a period system, a pyramid system, and it's headed by the steering committee which is providing top inputs and oversights of the pilots. The top of the pyramid is also there with the World Bank, which is the trustee, and they are managing the funds. The secretariat interacts with the pilots on a day-to-day -day basis and manages the overall implementation of the pilots. At the bottom of the pyramid, you'll find the pilot managers who are on the ground running the pilots and working directly with the implementing organization. At the associates, works independently as an entity evaluating and measuring the impact of the Ag Results pilot. <laughs> and there's one pilot that is currently on hold. The Nigeria AfroSafe pilot focuses on incentivizing the adoption of AfroSafe by smallholder maize farmers, which eliminates the harmful to toxins in maize. The Uganda Lagoon Seeds Pilot is designed to work with seed companies to improve Ugandan farmers' access to government-certified quality seeds, seed varieties. The Kenya on the Farm Storage Pilot we will be discussing in upcoming slides. The fourth pilot is the Zambia Biofortified Maize Pilot, which is designed to support the introduction of biofortified pro-vitamin A maize into the commercial, rural, and urban markets through an incentive prize, through incentive prizes for milling companies. The brucellosis pilot aims to encourage the development of improved, safe, low-cost, and effective registered brucellosis vaccine. The sixth and final approved pilot is the Vietnam Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Pilot which is designed to identify new approaches for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increase yield and rice cultivation by promoting tools to produce for products and practices not commercially available. Finally, the one pilot on hold is the Newcastle pilot, Newcastle vaccine pilot, which is designed to 
increase vaccination levels and create a market for vaccines, vaccine delivery to reduce the prevalence of the Newcastle disease. The pull mechanism is used is being used to create a rewards-based system that shines a light on the problem and incentivizes the private sector actors to invest in technologies they normally would not invest in. By tapping into these talents available in the market, the pilots are able to get different perspectives and ideas. This system inspires the participants to take risks on new technologies by improving existing technologies in order to receive the award. This approach is in contrast with the tradition, traditional development approach that uses grant models to determine the inputs and processes. The pull mechanism rewards achievement is an achievement of predefined results without preference to the strategies and the technologies involved in achieving these results. The Kenya on-farm storage pilot uses the pull mechanism to address post-harvest loss, which is a major problem throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, which was already mentioned. Annually, there's an estimated $1.6 billion post-harvest loss caused by spoilage and pests. Large grain borers and other pests significantly damage, cause significant damage in Sub-Saharan Africa and play a large role in the amount of loss seen in the eastern region of Kenya. There are easy solutions to post-harvest loss, but due to market barriers, the solutions are not currently available to smallholder farmers. The high cost in marketing and promotion of storage technologies reduces the incentive for private sector companies to develop affordable solutions for, sub for smallholder farmers. And due to the lack of exposure and limited access to these technologies, smallholder farmers are not aware of the improved storage solutions that can be provided to them. The, on, the Kenya on-farm storage pilot has a $7.5 million prize to create incentives for solvers in the private sector to develop solutions that will increase smallholder farmer income and will improve the over, and their overall livelihood. By creating a technologically agnostic framework, as a result incentivizes the creation and adaptation of technologies which help catalyze a sustainable market for storage devices for smallholder farmers. The pilot is testing an innovative model of engaging private sector actors in several to serve as serve the needs of smallholder farmers, with the potential future of applicability to deliver delivery of other goods and services. The pilot award payment system is based on implementers achieving the predetermined sales threshold. Pilots have been broken, the pilot has been broken up into two different award payment divisions, and this is divided by region. The Rift Valley has a mid and end award payment, whereas the eastern region only has one payment at the end of the pilot. This is due to the lead time required for research and development for a product that is large grain borer proof. For the Rift Valley, the midpoint award is given to the first five implementers that sell up to about up to 21,000 metric tons of storage for any single device. Each of the five implementers will receive a $750,000 performance-based grant. The end pilot award for the Rift Valley is for all implementers that sell at least 21,000 metric tons of storage for a single storage device. The award um, will be proportionally distributed and will be up to will be a distribution of a million dollars based on the capacity sold. The end award in the eastern region will also apply to all implementers that sell 21,000 metric tons of storage of any single storage device. And the award will be proportionally distributed a distribution of $3 million based on the capacity sold. To calculate the storage sold for a single device, the pilot has created an equation that calculates the cumulative useful life of each type of storage device. The sales which equals the sales of units multiplied by the storage capacity in kilograms multiplied by the assumed life in years, which equals the minimum threshold of 21,000 metric tons. The technologies currently being used in the pilot are hermetically sealed bags, plastic tanks, 
and metal silos. Additional technologies may be added throughout the life of the pilot with the addition of new implementers. The storage devices must have a storage capacity of nine, between 90 kilograms to 540 kilograms and must be affordable to smallholder farmers. They must also ensure that pests will be eliminated soon after the storage containers are sealed and that the pet, and there will not be pest infestation within four to six months of storing the grain. There's al also, there should be no adverse effect to the grain quality while the grain is being stored. To, use an to show an example of the calculations using the useful life of the technology, we'll be using the metal silo. Metal silo has approximately 20 years of useful life and stores up to 540 kilograms of grain. To reach the 21,000 metric tons, there would need to be 22,593 units sold. The pilot activities began in May 2015, and they will continue until July 2018. The mid and end pilot awards will be distributed after market surveys are completed and then to implementer sale data are verified, which means the final payout will not take place until 2019. Throughout the life of the project, there will be sales audits and surveys that will help verify the sales, help verify sales and also provide market data share for smallholder farmers in, in each region, which will help calculate the total shares for all smallholder farmers. Audit times will take place after major harvests, and the sales there will be verified in each audit and will, commu will accumulate and track, will be accumulated and tracked by the project management team. The pilot will set up a multi-verification system as a result of the implementer's inability to disaggregate sales by specific consumer types, which is caused by the multi-layered distribution and sales networks. Without significant investment in time of time and money and resources, implementers would not be able to trace the sales of their products. Throughout the life of the project, there will be a multi-layered verification process that will audit and verify sales reports provided by the implementers. These audits and surveys will help substantiate sales numbers and will also provide market share data for smallholder farmers in each region and to help calculate the overall sales of smallholder farmers. The Secretariat will bring on an independent verifier which will ensure that the number of the sales numbers are correct and to reduce the burden that would be placed on the pilot manager verifier. By following the verification method, the pilot will be able to determine the allocation of the midpoint and endpoint pilot prizes in each region. The Kenya on-farm storage pilot expects to impact approximately 480,000 smallholder farmers and generate at least 172,000 metric tons of storage capacity, which will generate approximately $14 million in benefits for smallholder farmers. The pilot also expects to see an impact in the implementers by allowing them to set up their products and, and marketing strategies that can be used after the completion of the pilot. The overall increase in storage capacity will directly impact smallholder farmers by improving their food security, but also giving them the ability to generate income by allowing them to store grain and sell them when the market prices are higher. The storage will also allow smallholder farmers to store grains until they are needed for personal consumption to reduce the need to purchase grains at high prices. The, sa the safely stored maize will also have a higher quality which will allow smallholder farmers to demand higher prices. With these incentives, farmers will see the benefits of increasing their production. Finally, as previously mentioned, through the improved storage of grains, farmers will also be able to improve their health by reducing the needs to spray their stored grains with pesticides. They will also be able to reduce the prevalence of aflatoxins through properly sealed storage devices that will reduce oxygen available, which will prevent the buildup of aflatoxins. Great, thank you so much, Para Stu. Uh, we are transitioning now to our second speaker, 
Betsy Ness Edelstein from App Associates, who will continue a discussion of the external evaluation of the AgResults Kenya on farm storage pilot. So please take it away. Thank you. Um, so I am Betsy Ness Edelstein with App Associates. I'm part of the external evaluation team for the AgResults initiative, which is a really exciting position to be in uh, on AgResults in particular because unlike many programs, AgResults actually has learning as part of its log frame as an outcome. It's a really exciting thing to have learning as such a central focus. Usually you have a log frame with development outcomes in it and then learning is sort of something that's um, more to the side and here it's really central. So we're excited to be involved and to be talking about it today. I'll talk a little bit about the AgResults learning agenda to get started and the evaluation questions that we're addressing. I'll talk about our evaluation timeline and where we are in the evaluation right now to situate what results we have and, and what we're still hypothesizing about. Um, I'll talk about the economic theory a little bit behind the AgResults model because that's really the foundation for our evaluation design um, and how we're looking at how AgResults addresses market failures, uh, specifically focusing on the Kenya case. I'll talk a little bit more about development hypotheses and expected impacts, um, elaborating a bit more on what Prostu has been discussing. I'll talk about our evaluation design. I'll touch on how we're addressing some of those evaluation questions. I will present some baseline findings, uh, things that we can address right now that we know now, and then move on to talk about what we're going to be paying close attention to during the pilot and what we'll be assessing at N-Line, so the things that we're paying particular attention to. And then I'll end on some early lesson learning around the design and implementation of this type of pull mechanism pilot, focusing on the Kenya case in particular. Okay, so the Ag Results Evaluation has seven core evaluation questions, and I'll focus today on just a couple of them. So broadly, uh, I will start with talking about the, um, the impact of Ag Results on private sector involvement in the development and uptake of on-farm storage. Put otherwise, what is the impact of Ag Results on the market for on-farm storage in Kenya? We'll also talk a little bit about the impact of Ag Results on smallholders. That means the impact that Ag Results has on their adoption of new technologies, and then also what impact they see from having adopted those new technologies. Other questions in the, in the Ag Results Learning Agenda concern sustainability and cost effectiveness, which I won't focus on today, although I'm happy to answer questions as to how we'll address those as we go forward. And then finally, um, as I said, I'll end by discussing some of the early lessons that we're developing around Ag Results, which is a kind of constant work in progress, um, developing these lessons learned as we go. So this is a uh, visual depiction of the timeline of our Ag Results evaluation for Kenya. Uh, as you can see um, from the shaded portion, we're just now at the end of our baseline data collection phase. We're now actually processing the baseline data uh, that we got from the field in Kenya. We'll collect, conduct end-line data collection and analysis after the pilot ends in 2018. So for today, since we're still in the baseline phase, we'll mostly be discussing our expectations and hypotheses about the pilot, but obviously things haven't really happened yet. The pilot has only begun about six months ago, so or maybe a little bit more than that, um, in May. So we'll be discussing a little bit about the baseline results and, and where things are right now. But all of the findings we present today are still sort of preliminary as we're still analyzing and processing baseline data. Uh, but of course, we would love to come back in three years and tell you all about the final results once we've had a chance to see how the pilot ends and, and to do an end-line impact evaluation and, um, and see what the, the final impact has been on smallholders. So back to the beginning, the, the evaluation framework that we're using is really based on the economic perspective of, um, of how, this, uh, how the pull mechanisms are designed to address market failures. Uh, which means, you know, for so one of one or more reasons, the market has failed to develop. Uh, in general, 
Ah, sorry, I think I'm missing some components here. Hmm. Ah, I've got a bubble graphic that's actually not showing up, but I will tell you that it sort of displays the interplay between the low demand for on-farm storage, the low supply of on-farm storage, and a policy and institutional environment. So in Kenya, the um, this is a schematic that, that we apply to all of the agri-results pilots. In Kenya, we specifically think the, the demand and supply side are key. The policy and institutional side in Kenya is actually um, in pretty decent shape um, when it comes to on-farm storage. There's, um, there's not really a, a regulatory barrier uh, to, to developing that market. But on the demand side, smallholders have a couple of significant constraints to market participation. First of all, there's extremely low awareness of improved on-farm storage technologies, even those of, that are already available in Kenya. And a couple of them have been available for uh, years, and in some cases, even a decade or more. But awareness is low, and awareness is also low of post-harvest issues and post-harvest loss management more broadly. That includes not only storage devices, but different practices uh, and things that they can do to mitigate post-harvest loss. Second, and also very importantly, farmers are constrained in their liquidity. They don't have funds necessarily to purchase expensive new products. And they're credit constrained. There aren't good loan products for farmers to purchase these technologies that haven't have been developed. Then on the supply side, the main constraint for firms is the upfront investment that they have to make to create that awareness and set up marketing and distribution. The ag results incentive comes in to operate really only at the supply side, the idea being that upfront investment barrier will be mitigated by the prize at the end. And the idea is that these firms are savvy and they have resources that they can draw upon to address the constraints that smallholders face. So AgResults does not address the smallholder part of the puzzle directly. They are leaving it to the firms to figure out strategies to reach smallholders. If the pilot works as planned, then smallholders will become aware and will start to adopt these technologies, and a sustainable market for on-farm storage will have been created. So this is the theoretical model of how things will unfold. So I'll go in a little bit deeper into the development hypotheses uh, of how, how we think that things may unfold in practice. Parstu touched on this at the end of her talk. Um, but when we go and design our evaluation, the first step is to do a lot of formative research. So the early activities involve uh, doing an extensive um, set of desk research and also going to Kenya. And we did a lot of um, interviews with farmers to understand their activities and, um, and practices and, and refine our understanding of the pilot's expected impact by gathering qualitative data about their current activities and how they're likely to respond to the private sector market for on-farm storage. So on the left here, uh, we talk about the market impact that we expect to see. And that's largely in line with what we were discussing earlier, that uh, firms will invest in product development and marketing, will work hard to strengthen their distribution networks or create those networks if it's a firm that's new to Kenya. And we actually are seeing that already. The firms are starting to engage in that way. And it's our expectation that because they are making those investments and are going to see a profitable market in Kenya, they will continue to market and sell these technologies after the pilots conclude. That's really key. Um, the pilot is not only aiming to put on-farm storage into the hands of smallholders while it's going on. It's seeking to create a sustainable market. So the smallholder impact side is similar to uh, what we discussed in the expected impact slide just now. But we've also refined some of those expectations based on our formative research a little bit. So absolutely, we think we're going to see a gain in smallholders' awareness of post-harvest loss issues and on-farm storage technologies. 
we do think that we're going to see a lot of purchasing of on-farm storage technologies, especially better off smallholders. And I say that because we know that these are expensive technologies for smallholders to purchase. Their normal storage bags, if they do purchase them, are usually about 50 Kenya shillings. The cheapest of the new technologies is about 300 shillings. And at 100 shillings to the dollar, that still seems fairly cheap, but if you think about it from the smallholder perspective, that's about six times what they are used to paying. So they really have to see that these are effective, and they have to know that there's going to be value for them down the road if they invest in these, um, that they're actually going to save grain and it will benefit in the, sorry, that it will benefit them in the long run. We also are expecting to see reduced food insecurity, and we think that's going to be one of the really key areas uh, of improvement for, for farmers. And in food security terms, we see that as improved availability with fewer or shorter periods of lean consumption and smoother food stocks uh, and less running out of maize um, at, the end of their, um, at the end of their season or right before their next planting season. We also, um, as Parastu mentioned, went and spoke with farmers. And one thing that we didn't actually expect when we started doing this formative research is that farmers, when we, plant, when we presented the, the idea of improved on-farm storage, said one of the things that are really, that's really interesting to them is that they may be able to store without using pesticide dust. And that was something that wasn't a huge focus in the original business plan for ag results, but turned out to be really important to farmers. They know that pesticides may be harmful to their health. They know that they may not be using them correctly. And they told us this is an interesting type of technology for the maize that they keep for consumption. Maize is the staple crop in Kenya, so farmers tend to keep a lot of their maize for consumption. and. That's really appealing to them because they think that pesticides are harmful to their family, and they're looking forward to, um, to not having to use pesticides or to using less of them. One thing we don't necessarily expect to see, at least in the short term, is a change in their maize sales patterns. That's because, like I said, farmers are, first of all, very consumption-oriented in the parts of Kenya that we're talking about, um, particularly the smallholder farmers. And also because they often tend to sell at the time that they do for reasons that are unconnected to the market or to fear of storage losses. So when you ask them, OK, why did you make this sale at this time, they give reasons like, I needed the cash for school fees or to pay off a certain loan. Or they say, that's when the trader comes to buy. They don't necessarily have the means to transport maize themselves. So when a trader comes to the farm gate and says, I'll purchase the maize from you today at the price that it goes for today, that's when they sell, and that's why they sell at that time. So in food security terms, the, the access piece is something that we don't necessarily expect to move in the short term. And we think that we may be able to see changes in the longer term as farmers start to get used to the idea of storing longer, and they see a little bit more flexibility in the market because of that. But um, we will definitely keep track of that to, to see how it pans out in the short term. So I won't focus it too much in detail. Oh, I'm missing another, missing another graphic, unfortunately. Um, well, that makes it very easy for me not to focus too much in detail on the, um, on the <laughs> evaluation design. And I know that most people are, um, I know most people in the audience are, um, are agriculture folks and not evaluation folks, but I will just touch on this, and I'm happy to answer questions later if people have them. First, uh, on the evaluation design for the market impact side of things, we based our evaluation on a structure conduct performance framework, which has a graphic that you can't see, unfortunately. Um, but basically, it's a theoretical framework that describes how markets and value chains function. So the, um, the structure of the market includes things like regulatory conditions, underlying the, um, numbers and types of market actors. The conduct is the, the way that firms engage in the market. And then performance is the, um, the extent to which the, the market is 
functioning well, the way that firms are performing. And in the AgResults case, it's the extent to which the market resolves underlying problems targeted by AgResults. So in terms of data, we're using a lot of qualitative data and conversations with the market actors, as well as um, secondary data on things like um, prices and uh, input, things like that. So uh, moving on to the smallholder impact evaluation, this is a sort of basic schematic that shows how our evaluation design is going to work. Um, we're using a quasi-experimental design called interrupted time series. Often an impact evaluation has a control or comparison group that people are um, probably thinking of right now. So that would be comprised of non-beneficiaries against which you would compare the treatment group. In Kenya, we found that AgriSalt is operating in most of the major maize growing areas of Kenya, which makes a lot of sense. It's a private sector market. You want firms to be able to operate in the places that are going to be most profitable to them. So it doesn't make sense to restrict their ability to sell in places where people might want to buy from them. Other maize growing areas that are outside of the pilot areas could have used as a comparison group, but we found that they were very different from the ag results areas in important ways, like the size of farms or the commercial orientation of farmers. So we decided that they weren't really a good comparison group, and we decided actually not to use a comparison group of farmers at all, but instead to opt for this interrupted time series design. This means that we're using multiple pre and post data points before and after the intervention, intervention to construct a time trend. So you can see on the left-hand side of that diagram, there's a solid line that shows the time trend. And then after the pilot start, we expect to see a jump in the um, adoption of these technologies in food security and things like that. So that's represented by that green bracket. And then the dotted line on the right side is just a, um, a projection of what the time trend might look like. This is just a simplified diagram to show the intu intuition behind our design. In reality, the trend lines might not be straight. They may have different slopes. This is something that we're actually going to go and measure once, we, um, once the pilot has, has finished. So we've done our baseline, and we have those pre-intervention points already um, collected data on those. And then we'll go back after the end of the pilot and collect data um, to see what actually happened. And I'll just mention briefly, we are also collecting data on what we call an unaffected outcome. And that's maize yield. That's something that we think is going to be influenced by everything that influences the pilot. So um, things like uh, yield, sorry, things like rainfall and all of those things that affect farmers will also affect maize yields. And it serves as something of a comparison. I just want to mention that, but, um, but we'll not depict it here because it's um, going to add another layer of complexity. And I think people probably want to move on to hear about findings. So um, baseline findings are, not surprisingly, we see a strong expected willingness to engage in this market. And we know that. Um, firms have been interested for a long time in entering the Kenyan market and have been a little bit daunted by the investment, but we've already seen that they're starting to engage and that they're excited about it. Their strategies, we think, are going to largely be to distribute through farmers, organizations, and commercial distributors. And those are things that they've done in the past. They find it a lot easier to partner with, um, with organizations that are closer to farmers directly rather than doing direct sales or, um, or another model. We think they're going to focus on established or high potential markets, which is not surprising. They're private sector firms, and it's certainly their prerogative to go to the places where they think they're going to have the most success right away. They're trying to sell a lot of storage quickly. We have heard from them there might be a possible preference for Rift Valley over Eastern, um, potentially partly because of the incentive structure that Press2 went through earlier, but also because larger grain borer is a lot more prevalent in Eastern, and so farmers have a, a, a bigger challenge, and the technologies um, developed for Eastern have to be, um, have to be LGB proof, and that's another challenge. 
Um, and then finally, we see that the private sector may not reach the most disadvantaged buyers, including women. And that's not to say that it necessarily is set up to do that. It is maybe by design that, uh, that slightly better off farmers may be participating. But we will be looking at how things roll out. If slightly better off farmers are the early adopters, we're going to be looking at how technologies then disperse into those less advantaged groups. On the smallholder side, uptake and awareness, unsurprisingly, are low, even among those products that are already on the market. And there are quite a few of them that have been in Kenya for a little while already. We see less than 5% uptake in both of those regions. Smallholders just haven't been purchasing them yet. And most of the technologies that farmers do have, if they have these already, have been distributed by various NGOs or other organizations, religious groups, um, that have been promoting them or subsidizing them. And they have not actually been purchasing them for the most part. There is a little bit of an upward trend, though, in both regions for all of the on-farm storage. So it's true that they're already starting to see a little bit of an increase, although, like I said, the, the rate of adoption so far is very low, less than 5% in both places. So moving on to the impact, what we're really going to be looking for. First, will the private sector successfully address smallholder awareness and financing constraints? We mentioned this is a really important component earlier, that smallholders are constrained and ag results relies pretty much entirely on the private sector to figure out how to get them the ability to purchase these technologies. Some of them are talking to banks, trying to partner with banks to create loan products that would apply directly to their products. Um, but we're going to have to see how this plays out. Farmers need to be convinced that the investment is worth it. And if they don't have the cash, firms need to work with them to figure out how they're going to purchase these products. Second, will smallholders use the new technologies properly and effectively? Something that we haven't talked too much about today is that grain needs to be in good condition before you store it for the storage to be effective. The grain has to be clean. It has to be dry to the, to the right moisture content before you even load it into the bags. So you can see in this, um, in this photo, there's a PIX bag, which is one of the storage technologies in AgResults. And it's tied up correctly. You can see that it is in a raised granary, so it's raised off the ground, which is good. Um, helps to prevent rodents and things from, uh, from getting in. But it is sort of in a pile of various things, and maybe not exactly the, the best storage practice. So that's something that farmers are going to have to really pay attention to, is not only putting it in the, in the bag, but then storing these technologies in the, the right conditions. Farmers also tend to want to use these bags for the grain they will consume. So what does that mean in practice? It means that they're going to be going into that grain bag and removing maize to go to the miller as they need it. So they're going to actually be opening and closing these bags on a regular basis. That's not really the laboratory condition. So it remains to be seen how that's going to affect the effectiveness of the technologies when farmers are going in and, um, and opening them up. Do insects get in? Do we have other problems? That's something that we're going to look at closely. And then, like I said, the pilot is not designed to reach disadvantaged groups, but we really want to look at how this rolls out. If larger, better off farmers are the early adopters, will there be uptake by disadvantaged groups later on once they see technologies being affected? Will people start to um, pick things up once, once they become more commonplace? We're really excited to see what happens there. And then finally, since since smallholders are so consumption oriented, sales are motivated by their cash needs mostly or their trader timing. And so we're going to, of course, be looking to see if there's an impact on the timing of their maize sales, of the prices they receive, and their revenue. So 
Finally, I will end just briefly on some early lessons that we're learning. And I want to emphasize that this is all our work in progress thoughts on what we're seeing so far. So this is still a pretty new pilot, and, um, and we're going to be paying lots of attention as it rolls forward. But so far, one of the, the first things that we think is really important and that we're seeing in Kenya is to understand what the key market failure really is. So ag results cannot address every part of the market failure. So we have to anticipate what market failures the poll may not address. And in Kenya, it's set up, I think, very well. The private sector is interested already. We know that. They're daunted by the upfront investment. But to move on to that second point, Kenya is targeting private sector firms that do have the ability to address the other constraints that cause the market failure. So they have, these firms have access to financing. Um, even though the prize comes at the end, if they need financing, these are large firms that do have access to other types of financing to, um, to pay for their upfront investments. They have the ability, they're savvy, to market and distribute new technologies. They know how to set up distribution networks. They then, and they want to. Um, and they have the ability to address smallholder constraints. They know how to partner with firms to do awareness creation. Sorry, to partner with NGOs or with government entities to do awareness creation. They are working with banks to try and figure out financing options. Some of them may finance some of these products directly. Um, we're waiting to see how they end up doing it. But they are being creative, and we can see that they're up to this challenge, I think. Another lesson learned is that there is going to be a trade-off in the design between development impact and market impact. So a lot of us in the development community are used to thinking, first and foremost, about the poorest beneficiaries. A poll mechanism has a challenge in reaching the poorest beneficiaries because there's a competing interest in developing a sustainable market through the private sector. So the private sector has to feel like they are going to be able to do that. They have to feel like there's something in it for them and that they can do this quickly and reasonably easily. So we need to realize that building a sustainable market may not be able to solely focus on the poorest of the poor, that private sector firms may need to address better off farmers first. Then there's the issue of designing the right incentive. So obviously, it has to be adequate to attract that private sector participation. So in Kenya, that seems to be playing out nicely. The private sector is clearly, by their participation, showing that they think that the incentive that they're going to be eligible for is enough to offset the risk or upfront investment that they have to make. The incentive has to be cost effective. And when I say that, we're thinking about cost effectiveness against what a push mechanism would be. So the cost of doing a pull mechanism extend not only to the payout, but also to the administrative and verification costs. And when we talk about incentive design, in Kenya, the incentive is limited to smallholder farmers. So not all sales will count. And that means that verification can be very expensive and complex, as you heard about before. Verification becomes more complex. and therefore more expensive the more you add conditions onto what the incentive is designed to cover. So we want to always kind of balance that development and market impact piece. And then finally, there's, all, there's always this question to push or not to push. We all want the pilot to succeed. We all want to see smallholders access technologies that will benefit will benefit them. And we really do want that sustainable market to develop. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. But we have to be a little bit hands off to see if this pull mechanism is going to work, especially since AgriZolt is operating through pilots. And this hasn't really been tried in agriculture very much before. So really, we want to see if the pilot can succeed without a lot of push. And in Kenya, um, we're, we're, there is not a lot of push going on. There is some. LGB testing for the technologies. But for the most part, AgriZolt is not doing any broad-based awareness campaigns, anything like that, even though the private sector 
wants push elements, I'm sure the private sector would love, and they've told us, you know, we would love you to come out and raise awareness about post-harvest issues in general, things that would help us to market our technologies. Agrisalt is not doing that, and um, and implementers, the the firms are still responding. They're still being creative, and they're figuring it out. So it's important to stand strong and and let the private sector do this itself. Um, even though they may be used to getting donor funds or getting subsidies in the past for the same products, and maybe even in the same countries, saying, you're, you're going to be able to figure this out, and then being a little bit hands-off seems to be working well in Kenya. So with that, um, I think Kenya is a great test case for pull mechanisms. And thanks, everybody, for um, letting me discuss for a little bit. And I'm happy to take questions. Betsy, that was very interesting, and I think your lessons learned definitely addressed a lot of the questions that have come in through the chat box. But we have had a lot of questions, so we'll we'll hopefully get to as many as we can. Uh, we would like to invite uh, a special guest to give kind of the, the first response, first question, um, and that is Bob Rabatsky, who is director of the Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation program. So we're hoping that you can unmute yourself now, Bob, and um, and speak, we'll let you know if we can hear you. Hi, hi there. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. OK, great. Um, thanks for that introduction and the opportunity to, to uh, provide a few comments and uh, a kickoff question. Um, hello to uh, many of you that I know out in the chat, uh, the chat room. Um, happy 2016. It's great to see that you're all uh, involved in this particular um, presentation. Um, and thanks a lot to the presenters. Uh, uh, wonderful points made by all, um, and certainly uh, highlighting a, a big challenge, not only in Kenya, but obviously um, facing smallholder farmers worldwide. And that is just generally um, how, you, how you protect your investment in producing food and, um, and make sure that it gets to market in good condition. Um, obviously, a, a huge problem. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, multi-billion dollar problem, losing 14 percent uh, or 15 percent on average of, of, uh, of grains is, uh, that's, that's significant. Um, so that, that presents a, a very good opportunity for companies who are trying to enter this market and, and uh, sell products. Um, I, I agree um, with Betsy when she said that Kenya is a really good country to try this out. Um, you know, it's, it's got a, a decent uh, private sector oriented policy environment. It's business friendly. There are an amazing number of innovators and in small businesses starting up. They, they don't call it the Silicon Savannah for nothing. Um, I think that the smallholder sector there is probably as advanced as you'll find smallholder sectors in, 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 the, in the countries where we work with Feed the Future. Um, a, a thriving um, uh, ag sector, and they have good, a good network of dis distributors who can um, get technology like this out to, out to farmers uh, on a commercial basis. And you know, uh, I know you were talking uh, about how, how you push this technology. How do farmers learn about this? And I think that this is really, really a critical issue that uh, your program, my program, uh, is also trying to address through their partners. And, it represents a, a, a huge upfront cost that, you know, there, there is very little extension going on. And so uh, any kind of training needs to be done by these companies who are really offering the technology or by um, don donor projects or other projects that have an interest in promoting it. So smallholder farmers, generally speaking, will invest in, in, in technology, in better technology, but they, are, uh, they need to be shown the benefits of it over the cost. And, and, and for these, these three systems that uh, I think were presented today, uh, that, that's a very important point. You know, the storage bags are, are very low cost. They don't necessarily, they won't get the longevity that, that the, you know, the, the plastic or the metal containers will. So they may lose points on that one in your evaluation. But, but still, it makes it very accessible to small farmers, uh, although $3 is, is, is um, a lot to spend up front. You can show these farmers where that $3 investment will pay off quickly. And that's very important for anyone promoting the technology. 
um, and and price is very very important. Um, uh, so you know it'd be interesting to see how your partners are addressing price and and affordability of the product, um, which is a key factor. And there are strategies you can use to to address af affordability. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have to sell a product uh, outright. You can. Uh, you can do some sort of barter or exchange. There's certainly financing available, although in Kenya financing is quite expensive these days, 18 to 20 percent interest, um, and not necessarily available to small farmers. Um, rental and leasing ideas or pay per use could also be explored. Um, there are companies trying this with other technologies, solar panels and things like that. Um, and um, since these are portable devices, if, if someone is not paying their, let's say, their monthly rent on the device, it's easy to come in and take it away. Um, and also, maybe for the expensive, more expensive ones, you could look at um, aggregation points and um, selling to community groups instead of to individuals. Um, so I guess I, I, I'll sum up there and, 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 and put the first question out there, because there are a lot of very good questions in the chat box. Um, I, I understand that you're, you know, you're, you're paying, you're incentivizing um, these uh, these companies through sales um, and and payments based on those sales. But there, I didn't hear that there was any kind of upfront investment being made. So, how are the companies actually doing this education, um, getting this word out that these products are beneficial and therefore creating market demand? You know outright advertising and, and marketing strategies and education. Um, these are really important when you're introducing new technologies, and I'm curious to learn more how that is, that is being done. And I'll leave it at there. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bob. If you wouldn't mind muting your microphone. Great. That sounds good. And um, to our speakers, would you be able to address Bob's question about education. Um, and get, kind of creating demand through education. So, so far what we've seen and heard from the firms is that they are planning to do that. Sorry, the sound is working OK? OK. Yeah. So, um, sorry. So the the um, the firms are, for in large part, not planning necessarily to do this themselves. They're they're using established networks and, in some cases, government entities with um, with already firm relationships with farmers. They're working with NGOs. Um, they, I think, are planning some various campaigns, radio, and things like that. But um, I don't know if Parastu, you wanted to add anything. Um, yeah, no, we, from what we've been told, you know, they're going to be working with the sales. You know, most of the equipments are being distributed to sales points. And so I think it's more through word of mouth and you know, trying to get the information out there, but I'm not sure at the moment if they're taking on any large-scale marketing of the equipment. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and dive into some of the questions from the participants. Uh, this is a question about the evaluation, so directed at Betsy. Uh, from your surveys, were you getting different responses from farmers depending on the agroecological zone? in which they lived or worked? And that's from James Theory who asked that question. Yeah, a little bit. Um, one thing that we're focusing on particularly is just disaggregating everything by the two regions. So far, we see in Eastern, awareness is pretty high. I think we've seen 16 or 17 percent of farmers say that they are aware of at least one of the improved technologies that, um, that may be a a participant in the AgResults pilot. In Rift Valley, it seems a little bit lower at this point. Um, but the farm, the farmers there 
are just as interested, if not more so. I think they tend to be a little bit um, larger in their land holdings and are producing more maize. So we've seen a little bit of difference between the two regions. But um, but I would say overall, and, and, and they do grow slightly different things in Eastern. I think we've seen people growing more crops that can be stored, so there's a little bit more diversity. These bags can also hold beans, green grams, things like that. So we see farmers that might be interested in using the bags for, or these technologies, for more than just maize, maybe a little bit more so in Eastern. This is also something that we're going to look at closely as we track the pilot going forward. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone that uh, Chulika is on the line from APT, who has been working with AgResults for quite some time and is an expert in this project. And so we thought we'd try and throw a question out to you, Chulika. Um, so a question came in from Jennifer Bremer. What about stri strategic behavior by farmers preferring to wait for another donor-funded NGO to provide free or low-cost equipment? rather than buying them uh, or buying them in the present and then another NGO shows up next week and maybe they don't feel, um, you know, they feel a little bit stupid for having uh, jumped the gun. That's just a complex situation and um, we were wondering how AgResult is dealing with that complicated scenario. So do you want to try unmuting yourself, Talika, and addressing that question? Yeah, sure. First of all, uh, hello, everybody, and really nice to see such a big uh, crowd and so many questions and answers. Um, and thanks for that question, Jennifer. It's interesting that you raised the point about strategic behavior. Um, I think that's possible. I think farmers may, depending on their proximity to existing NGO programs, may make those decisions. But the hope is that because we are using, AgriSelf is using a private sector-led approach, there will be a much larger scale penetration. The idea is that by making private sector compete, we'll be able to push out technologies to uh, many retail markets. So essentially, we'll be able to capture smallholders who are not being uh, you know, touched by those programs. Um, and, uh, and and that point also goes to another question that was in the chat room about what happens and how does this all play out in the context of all the subsidies. So yeah, there'll be some impact of the subsidies, but the hope is that the scale is much larger. But I did want to say, since you mentioned the word strategic behavior, that in these pull mechanisms, we are watching out for strategic behavior between the uh, implementers that are incentivized vis-a-vis um, -vis the smallholders. In Kenya, fortunately, the incentives are designed in such a way that there is uh, no specific strategic behavior on the private sector's part that could affect development impact. But in other pilots, um, sometimes there can be uh, uh, strategic behavior that can limit the complete development impact. And we're watching that as a very interesting uh, piece that we will be looking at. I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you, and we could hear you well. Um, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, right, sorry, everyone. We're we're just combing through some of the questions. All right, so we had another question come in from David Mbuga. Is the initiative focusing on or encouraging more local private sector actors? or external actors, uh, are they also equally encouraged to participate? So this approach that we're focusing on is very technologically agnostic. So it is promoting you know, all different types of technologies that exist that can be adapted for smallholder farmers, and also the creation of new technologies. We're really focusing on developing what is exist, exists, but also creating something that will help smallholder farmers. So it is bringing in you know, large corporations that are producing this and also smaller innovators that can enter the market with these new innovations. Just to mention some of the storage containers that are being, the technologies that are being used, there's the hermetic, hermetically sealed um, storage bags, which are multi-layered 
sealable bags that can store up to 90 kilograms and have a shelf a life of three years. Plastic tanks that are durable and affordable and airtight and are capable of storing more than 100 kilograms of maize. And then metal silos, which are the largest of the three, and they're sealable silos that have recently been adapted for smallholder farmers and have the capacity of up to 500 kilograms of maize. There is another um, bag that has been created that is also hermetically sealed but all, and infused with pesticides. This has been improved by the pesticide board in Kenya. However, it has not entered, um, has not been entered in the pilot yet through an implementer. Um, great, and, and since you were mentioning uh, hermetic storage bags, we had a couple of people discussing those on the webinar. Um, and so there was a question from Anthony Kavingua. How much will the farmer have to invest in these hermetic liner bags? Uh, will they not be too expensive for the smallholder farmer? Will this not lead to dependency syndrome? Um, I hear that some cost-benefit analyses have been done for PIX bags, and so I was hoping you could uh, just discuss a little bit more these concerns about them being a little bit too expensive or, um, yeah. Yeah, to that question, it is really interesting to see how farmers react to the prices and understand based on that what, what do they really value. So a lot of farmers don't even necessarily pay for the bags that they currently use. A lot of them are repurposing fertilizer or seed bags and using those to store their maize, or they're buying just regular polypropylene bags that cost them 50 shillings or less. Like I said, the cheapest of the new technologies is at least 200 to 300 shillings. So that's a significant increase in cost. The most expensive on the, on the metal silo side goes up to tens of thousands of shillings. So um, the, the metal silos come in different sizes, and they have different prices based on that. But So there's a wide range of prices, but you're right, they are definitely more expensive than what farmers are used to. In some cases, the, the entire investment for a year, um, for the entire season for a farmer and in their inputs is only 1,000 or 2,000 shillings. So if you think about the cost of the bags relative to what they're used to spending. It's a good question. And if we go back to what farmers are saying they value in terms of these bags, they're not necessarily thinking about them to store grain that they're going to sell. They think of selling maize right off the bat as soon as they harvest and dry it so that they can get the cash income right away. And then they keep the grain for storage in these hermetic bags or metal silos. That's what they're telling us that they're most interested in. So we know and they know that um, these bags are going to reduce post-harvest losses, but they need to figure out how much that is worth to them. And so there's going to have to be sort of an attitude shift away from, oh, post-harvest losses are sort of the natural way of things. Some people say it's just um, nature taking its part. People don't necessarily know how much they lose. It happens little by little. So they have to weigh those things against the cost of the bag and our technology. And, and we'll see. Um, the, the pesticide issue is also an interesting one. So pesticides have a cost, obviously. But it's not on the order of the price of the technologies. And so it's up to the farmers to decide what they think the, the trade-off is between the health benefit of not using pesticides versus the cost of the, the new technology. We're definitely going to do a cost-effectiveness analysis and look at, um, look at how this plays out in the pilot. Interesting. I'm glad you addressed the pesticides, because uh, a couple of our participants were discussing those. And that is a complicated issue as well. So it's good to hear that the, the evaluation will address pesticide use as well. Um, all right, Tulika, we thought we'd ask another question to you. This is a question from Elon Gilbert. And it is, does the pilot that design that Betsy was describing include impacts on changes in who does the storage? 
is the hypothesis that the use of these technologies will mean that farmers store more or store longer than others. Uh, in other words, store longer than middle actors in the value chain, such as aggregators, traders, et cetera. I know you addressed this a little bit in the chat box, but we'd love for you to, to pull it out verbally as well. Hi, thanks for that question, Alan. It's a, it's a, I would say, a really interesting question um, because it actually um, um, adds a new dimension to the way we were looking at it. So we are certainly looking at, uh, as Betsy explained, uh, what's going to happen to smallholders' storage decisions? Uh, when will they be selling it? What the sales timing is? And as she noted, I mean, our initial hypothesis is that it may not move that quickly because their decisions on the sales timing are based on the constraints that they face and the school fees that they have to pay and so forth. Um, so from the large sample survey, we will be um, getting these estimates from the smallholders on how long are they storing and what's happening. On the side of the, rema the, uh, the remaining part of the value chain on who's storing the traders and how is it moving, we will be capturing it through the structured conduct performance approach, which is assessing the impact of pilot on the market. And essentially, what is happening to the market for the storage technologies? Um, and I think your uh, your point actually helps us, um, you know, address this piece of well, how long are the storing and getting that perspective from the traders. Uh, so it's actually a really interesting point and a good way to look at um, some of the findings that we will uh, that we will collect from our various surveys, both quantitative and qualitative. Thank you, Chilika. Um, that was a very helpful answer. And there have been a, a couple of questions about aflatoxin. And I know that we couldn't dig into aflatoxin um, deeply today at this particular webinar. But it is an issue that Feed the Future is looking at uh, very intensely right now and doing a, a great job, I think, of addressing. And we have a, a number of aflatoxin-related projects. So we'll post another link to some aflatoxin-related resources that are up on AgriLinks in the chat box. And we're hoping to have another webinar sometime this year or um, some additional content on aflatoxin to highlight for all of you. But it is absolutely one of the kind of main issues that we're trying to pre prevent with all of this on-farm storage. All right, we have time for a couple more questions before we, we wrap up. And so we are uh, coming through your excellent list of questions. Thank you all for the questions and comments that you've been posting in the chat box, especially those of you have, who have been sharing examples and experiences from your own work. Uh, they're extremely helpful, and we encourage you uh, to share uh, some links, especially before you go, if you have suggested resources for the other participants here. All right. I'm looking through our list. Just because we had uh, a lot of discussion in the chat box on the issue of, of rats and rodent infestation, we just thought we'd toss it out to our, our presenters. Um, kind of what is that interplay with rats? Can they bore through the bags that are in question, uh, the fixed bags? Um, how can grain be distorted so that rats can't destroy it? Are insects or rats a bigger, uh, bigger concern? <laughs> uh, in terms of insects versus rats, I think that probably you would have to ask each individual farmer for their, their take and their particular uh, storage setup. Um, yeah, rats are definitely an important issue. And we know that these it, with some exceptions, the metal silos do protect against rats, but rats can bore through a bag if they if they want to. What we've heard is that they can't necessarily smell the grain inside the bag unless it's opened. So if the rat doesn't know it's in there, sometimes they won't get into it. But um, but yeah, metal rat guards are a completely separate um, investment for a farmer to make, and it's um, it's a it's a good investment for them to put those metal rat guards at the bottom of their granary. Some of them also invest in cats. But um, but the, the hermetic bags in particular are not rat proof at all. Um, just to add on to that, there's also, there's also been discussion about elevating the bags and making it harder for the rats to access the bags. I mean, there's always creative ways to get around rat infestation. It is a major problem that 
you know, farmer's space. And some farmers try to alleviate that problem by storing the bags in their homes, um, which is not a foolproof method, as rats can get into many places. But it is something that farmers are facing. And unfortunately, the hermetically sealed bags do not overcome that problem. But over time, when farmers are able to invest in better technologies, like the plastic um, tanks, it is a way to overcome that problem. Very interesting. Thank you. So we are coming up on the end of our webinar today. Um, before we wrap up, um, please take a moment to take the polls that you see on your screen. Uh, they definitely help us shape and improve these webinars for the future. So we always appreciate your input. Or you're always welcome to simply put your input in the chat box or email uh, me, Jay McCarty, at USAID.gov or agrilinks at agrilinks.org. Uh, to share your comments and suggestions for future webinars. So with just a couple of minutes left, and because we've been so fortunate to have Talika joining us um, from uh, a remote location, we would love Talika to just have any final comments that you might have. We know that you've been answering some questions in the chat box, which we greatly appreciate. Based on what you've seen in the chat box, kind of the questions and concerns that, that people have, um, or just where you see the agriculture project heading in the future. Do you have any final comments from the evaluation team? Thanks for that opportunity. Um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, uh, lots of uh, interesting things to say about pull mechanism. But just uh, hearing a bit from the chat room, uh, just wanted to respond to a few comments. Um, I think Bob made a comment about um, you know how are we going to have the private sector have demonstration plots or um, find the early adopters. And that's a tough challenge. And will private sector be able to take it? Um, and I think, uh, I think that uh, what we're finding is that by dangling this prize at the end, which is properly priced, we can let the creative juices run. And we're seeing a lot of partnerships by the private sectors to work with entities that know how to uh, market to smallholders. So that is the exciting part of it, that you're not figuring out as a donor what's the best way to reach the smallholder, but you're saying that, look, private sector, you're good at marketing and selling things, and can you solve the problem of marketing and selling to the smallholder? Um, and so the things to watch out there is, um, well, will that approach uh, of creating the market, engaging the private sector, reach all the smallholders or not? And as we mentioned in our lessons learned that you know there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off potentially in achieving, um, creating a market and achieving scale, and and reaching all the smallholders. But it will eventually get to that. And perhaps to also address the point about what about these subsidies? What about these free rollouts? Maybe those need to be focused specifically on the poorest of the poor, the the entities that cannot be easily engaged with the private sector-led approach, so that a nice coordination between a pull and push strategy to get to our development goals would be would possibly be the best way to do it. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to just add uh, uh, to all the folks who joined today, all the ag results pilots are, as the name suggests, on agriculture. And uh, the, the, the assessment that we'll be doing across those pilots is also very interesting. Um, and and the idea of the prize design, should it be, um, you know, the prize itself should be linked directly to um, reaching the smallholder or not is another thing they're watching. Like in Kenya, the sales uh, that are rewarded are the ones that lead to um, purchase by smallholders. Uh, but there are pilots where that link is not directly made. But the idea is that if the market is created, the smallholder will be touched. And you know, when you create a price design where you're making this uh, price dependent on smallholder engagement, it does increase the verification cost, leading to greater cost of the pilot and reduced cost effectiveness. So that balance, again, is very interesting to watch out for. And so watch the space as we generate more lessons learned from the uh, evaluation team on this very interesting pilot. Wonderful. Thank you, Tilika. Um, so with that, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. 
by virtue of attending the webinar today, you will receive an email uh, in about a week or, or, or a little bit longer that contains the recording of today's webinar, uh, a transcript, the text from the chat box, which I saw was specifically requested by at least one person, um, and a PowerPoint, uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation today. So we'll make sure that you are equipped um, via email with all of the resources from today's webinar. I would like to extend a sincere thank you to Aviva, Parastu, and uh, Betsy, and especially to Lika also for joining remotely, um, and Rodrigo also who's been answering some questions in the chat box, and uh, Bob Robatsky also for our first response. We've had just a, a great suite of speakers today. So thank all of you very much for your participation. Um, but an even bigger thank you to our audience uh, without you attending and asking your great questions. Um, the Accept to Council series would not be what it is, so we appreciate your participation. And lastly, thank you to the KidAd team, always for your excellent support of these webinars and seminars uh, continually uh, through the AgriLinks platform. All right, we're going to wrap up. Have a wonderful Thursday, a great weekend, and if you're in D.C., um, I hope you enjoy the upcoming snow, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.